there's so mm -hmm. much uh, about different cancer treatments, these mm -hmm. new treatments that are coming out, and we get very excited that we are pushing the boundaries of improving cancer care. And then we have to deal as medical professionals with the frustration of trying to get these medications approved. Do you ever have the situation where the patient is ready to start the medication, you're ready to prescribe it, and then there's a delay with having insurance company approve that medication? Oh, yes. It's really frustrating. It really is. Um, so I, we live with that all the time. And then when you're you know, dealing with you know, a visit face-to-face -face and saying, hey, we want to get this drug for you, but, but we can't, it, um, and having that conversation with the patient, you just feel like you've let someone down. Of course. Um, but I have to look at the bright side. You know, in ovarian cancer, we went eight years. It was like eight years before we had a drug approval. And then we had uh, two drugs approved the same year, one of them being Lamparza, another one being Bevacizumab, which is known as Avastin. That was exciting. Now we have two more PARP inhibitors. So we are adding mm -hmm. to our toolbox the drugs that we can use that are actually helping our patients. Now you've talked about how these drugs are available and how if you're, if you're with the right doctor who can work with the insurance companies to get these medications approved. They are FDA approved, so there may be a delay in actually having the insurance company approve paying for them. What about the patients who see second opinions who may come to you as an expert that may have been eligible for them, but they've not been under the best possible care and may never have been offered those medications? How common is that? Um, so this all happened pretty quickly with the PARP inhibitors. Remember, you know, it was just December 2016 that uh, Rubraca was approved and Zajula was just approved. We, we can't get that drug yet for patients off of a trial. But in that specific situation that you're talking about with a patient coming and, and not having access to some of these new drugs, I'm in such a fortunate situation. I'm at a university where we have um, two large uh, trials ongoing that they can get access to PARP inhibitors. We have another um, phase three trial that's ongoing with another PARP inhibitor that I can get access for them. And then we have phase one trials that are now combining these different drugs. So that's really the future is combining these different agents and understanding do patients have biomarkers that can tell us that they're going to benefit more from this drug more than the other, like the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers. We know that their magnitude of benefit from these PARP inhibitors may be greater than somebody who doesn't have the biomarker. And, and although mm -hmm. you know, the future is very bright mm -hmm. with new drugs coming on the horizon and such rapid progression in, in what we can mm -hmm. offer patients, it, there's really quite a commitment on doctors in the field to keep up to date with it changing so rapidly. For somebody like Michelle, who's mm -hmm. eligible for these medications, and particularly with new medications on the, on the constantly coming out, when do you say, well, I don't think this is effective as it could be, and now there's a new kid on the block, let's consider changing treatment. How do you decide yeah. when a treatment is not effective enough and we should consider switching medication? So we kind of have these conversations in clinic, like things look good right now, but, but maybe the CA125 is creeping up a little bit, let's keep a close eye, this is gonna be our plan A, this is our plan B. So we've, we're on plan A right now. We already have plan B, B in the back pocket. And you so mentioned CA wait. one two five, the blood test that is used to assess progression and uh, or response to treatment. Is that the only thing that you use to determine whether a drug's working, no. or are you scanning no. patients? Blood work. Are you shaking your head? I'm like no, <laughs> no, no. no. no All we, kinds of blood work. We have our eyes on that, but we yeah. we got a CT scan and that kind of showed us that things had gotten um, worse. So I rarely will make a change on a CA one twenty five value alone. Um, I use the imaging studies as well as the physical exam, which is really important, and also patient symptoms. You know, yeah, just talking to yeah. me and how are you feeling, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's a few things I'll say. Yeah. I think last year I picked up my ears were ringing, and then we're like, oh, wait a minute, no more chemo for you because I had de de developed tinnitus mm -hmm. from one of the chemo drugs. And how so. often were you getting scanned, Michelle? Um, there's not a frequency. We don't like use maybe like maybe six months, I guess. After, yeah. yeah. So I pretty um, so I'm tr try to follow the guidelines and the current Society of Gynecologic Oncology guidelines say that we should do scanning based on clinical indications. So on a clinical trial, people are scanned at very regular intervals because that's the study. Mm -hmm. But off of a trial, I really try to follow um, 
the CA125, the exam, and patient symptoms. And, and then that will trigger a scan if we need and one. And when you're having a conversation with patients about these drugs before you start treatment and you're explaining to the patient, look, we have these drugs that are now available to treat your disease, what percentages of response do you discuss with the patients when they say, well, you know, how likely is this to help me? Right. So this is where um, this field has expanded. So I mentioned for Zajula that it has been approved for all comers who have platinum sensitive disease. But what you can do with all these drugs is say, look, you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. This is going, this is your response rates based on the study. And they're higher for that group of patients. If you don't have the mutation, there's still activity, there's anti-tumor activity, but it's not as high. And that really helps gauge the benefit to the patient in terms of controlling the cancer, the side effect profile, and is this going to be the next drug we use versus a different drug? If a patient does well early on and responds very effectively mm -hmm. in the beginning, is that good news for down the line? Does that mean if you respond well in the first few weeks or months that you're more likely to remain a responder? Or um, do these tumors morph into more aggressive tumors that may potentially become resistant to the treatment? So are you asking that in general or specific to PARP inhibitors? For both. Okay, so in general, I just have to give Michelle a high five here. I so know. <laughs> Michelle has platinum sensitive, she had a platinum sensitive recurrence. Twice. She I got, think. Um, yeah, and then when she um, had her second, um, when she had her first recurrence, she went into remission again with um, platinum based therapy and then was on maintenance um, of Aston for yep. quite some time, yeah. And so, um, so, she, you know, in her situation, um, she still has cancer that's responding to our standard of care chemotherapy. So we can always go back and recycle that. So that's really good news. The, for a lot of women, um, they don't necessarily have that story where, you know, when they have that first recurrence, the platinum doesn't get rid of all their cancer or their cancer um, doesn't go away all the way or it comes back really quickly. And so we know in those situations that acquired resistance has developed. In the PARP inhibitor story, it, people are still exploring this and trying to understand it. It may be that you have the BRCA1 mutation, that helps you be more sensitive to the chemo, but somehow the cancer cells get so smart, they revert that mutation back to a normal, and maybe that could increase resistance. And there's this concern of how does it affect getting chemotherapy later? And those are questions that still remain to be answered. The data that we have right now is in such a small number of patients and is reassuring, but it's just too small for us to say for sure.